What's everybody doing today? Well, my name is Jim, if you're new here, and today is our family Sunday, so we are going to incorporate our elementary age kids. So we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm a little nervous. It's kind of hard to practice what I'm going to do this morning at home. It's not a magic trick, okay? So we're just going to uncover this. You know I'm an addict when I bring a 14-foot John boat up on stage. <laughs> a fishing addict. So we're going to do a little bit different thing today. We're going to tell a story from the book of Mark. And what I need is I need our elementary kids to come up here to help me tell the story. We're going to tell the story about Jesus being in the boat with the disciples. And so we need some disciples to come up here. So kids, don't be shy. You can come on up here. Get a couple of these things set up here. Take us a minute here. We're going to have a little bit of fun. All right, so first thing I need is I needed Jesus. You going to be Jesus for me? All right, you need to put a beard on. You've, you've you got it backwards, but that's okay. There you go. Yes, spin it around this way. There you go. You've been waiting years to grow that beard, aren't you? All right, we're going to put this around your shoulders here. That's your mustache. All right, make sure you turn around so everybody can see your, your cool-looking beard and stash. Look at that. <laughs> woo -hoo! All right. Now, you're going to be Jesus. You've got an important job. You are going to lay down on that cushion back there, and you are going to fall asleep, all right? So your parents will be upset with me by the time this is all over, but you're going to, you're going to act like you are sleeping, all right, so we got some fishermen here. We need some people to hop on in there in the boat there. Okay, we'll get some people in the boat. All right, I got my back to the camera. Okay, you guys won't have to hold these up. What we're going to do is we're going to, when I, as we start telling the story, what I'm going to have you guys do is I'm going to have you guys be the wind, all right? All right, so we're going to blow, we're going to stand off to the side, and we're going to blow wind onto these disciples and Jesus that are in the boat, all right? Sound like fun? All right, so let me get... I'm going to hop here in the boat and tell the story, so don't get me wet. I didn't, there's no, no life jackets. And let me grab these two because we're going to, look at that. She's already getting me wet. We're going to grab these because we're going to have some fun with these here in just a second. You ever, you ever been in a boat that took on water? Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we'll have to, have to hear this story. All right, so this is going to be from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. I'm going to walk you guys through this. We're going to help me do this as we go through this. All right, so... So this that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, "Let us go to the other side." So Jesus is going to go to the other side of the lake. All right, he's been teaching all day; he's exhausted. So leaving the crowds behind, they took him along just as he was, which meaning he was there with them. It says in the boat, and there were also other boats with him. Now, just so you guys know, as we're t telling this story, this is just giving us information that an eyewitness was here observing this. All right. So then it says, "As they're all in the boat." All right. It says, a furious squall came up. You know what a furious squall is? You ever heard of a squall? A squall is a quick burst of wind, all right? So we need the wind to get the clouds going. We got the wind going, all right? So furious squall came up. The waves broke over the boat. Let's get your waves going, guys. Get your waves. There you go. Get those waves going, all right? Broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. We're taking on water, guys. We got to get the water out of the boat. So act like you're dumping water out of the boat. Yeah, we got it's nearly swamped. We're taking on water. And where's Jesus? Jesus was in... The stern sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him up. You guys got to wake Jesus up. He is sound asleep. They woke him up saying, teacher, don't you care if we drown? So let's wake Jesus. Jesus, come on, buddy, wake up, man. Don't you care? Don't you care we're going to drown? And then Jesus got up. Let's go ahead and stand up. And he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Say quiet, be still. Quiet, be still. All right. Wow, look at that. The power of God is right here. And it says, the wind died down and it was completely calm. And then he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And it says, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? It's a pretty cool story, isn't it? All right, you guys did a great job this morning. <laughs> Woohoo! Thank you. I was Good job. 
Yeah, you could just lay that in a boat. Perfect. Oh, sweet. You guys are awesome. All right, Hollywood's going to be calling us any moment here. <laughs> Got some professional actors here. All right, so this is a story we're going to be diving into today from Mark chapter 4. So let me just take a moment. I'll pray as we just dive into God's word. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for your word, the power of your word, that you have the power to calm the storm. And sometimes in this life, we experience all kinds of crazy storms, and we just need you. And so we just give this time to you this morning, just ask you to open your word up to us as we dive in. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this is a really, really cool story. As I was just diving into it this week, get that little diving into it in the water. So... So I look like a redneck this week because I have this 14-foot John boat in the back of my minivan, and so people are looking at me driving down the road wondering where I'm going with this thing. But I just want to, I think it's important that we incorporate the kids in what we're doing and just help them grasp the essence um, so that they can remember these stories as we dive into them together as a church. And we're just going to look at a couple of different things, just kind of give you some input on this story. So this all took place in the Sea of Galilee. All right, which is about 680 feet below sea level, and it's surrounded by hills. And so this was a common thing that these storms would just pop up out of nowhere. You know, and here in the Midwest, we're kind of used to crazy storms, aren't we? Not so much out on the water, but, but, you know, we have these tornadoes that hit, and sometimes, you know, they unexpectedly come. And what's interesting is that this was something that these disciples probably were used to. I mean, some of these guys were fishermen. It wasn't like they'd never been out on the water before. But this one just seemed to be a furious storm that hit. And so we're just going to look at a couple things this morning on what do we do when the storm hits. Now, just to tell you a personal story. I remember when I was about one of these guys' age, I was a little kid, and it was one of my, my early experiences in being in a boat, and I'm surprised that I like getting out on the water and fishing because I was really little. We took a trip up to um, the Chesapeake Bay area, Solomon's Island. Anybody ever been up there that direction? And it was with my uncle, um, my aunt and my uncle and my mom and dad, and we weren't boat people. Um, you know, my, I don't even remember my dad ever getting in a boat. But he decided, my uncle decided to take us out on the bay. And so my mom and dad, my brother and I, my aunt and uncle, a couple of my cousins, we get in this, this boat. It wasn't a whole lot much bigger than this. Um, and we go out, and we're out there cruising around. He's showing us the bay, and then the engine stalls. I mean, we're a good way out. I mean, the bay, the Chesapeake Bay is pretty wide. And the engine stalls. <laughs> And he's, you know, I mean, there's just nothing, you know. And, and so I don't know if the battery died. I don't know if it was something the motor. But he's sitting there working on it, working on it, nothing, nothing. Well, wouldn't you know, about this, this time, the wind started picking up. And all of a sudden, off in the distance, you could see these dark clouds moving in. And we're out there, and my, my uncle's just like waving his hands, trying to get somebody else's attention. You know, there's nobody, you know, that's paying attention to us. And all of a sudden, it starts raining, <laughs> You know, so my uncle has us put our life jackets on, and I, I'm pretty scared at this point in time, you know. It's like I'm just a little guy, and I can barely see over the side of the boat. And, and it started pouring down rain. The wind started picking up. The boat started rocking. Nothing. We can't get a hold of anybody. No radio, no nothing. It was like a, 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 a little bit bigger than a bass boat. And so my uncle took off his shirt and dove in the water and swam all the way to shore. I mean, it was a good distance to get help. But we're out there all by ourselves, you know. And, of course, my dad, he, we weren't boat people, like I said. So we didn't know what we were doing. But I just remember I was terrified. And I'm, that, was, that was when I first learned to pray, you know. <laughs> God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll be a good kid the rest of my life, you know. Of course, I did keep my promise. But anyway, it was a crazy story, I'll tell you that. I was scared. I was scared for my life. And the good thing was it wasn't very long. We were, we were taking on water. It wasn't a lot, but they did bring somebody out in another boat, and they had to tow us in. But it was a very scary incident. And as we see in this story, that this was a very scary incident for, for disciples that many of them were used to this kind of weather. They'd been through it before. They were out on the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't a new thing, as I said earlier, that happened out on the Sea of Galilee. And so there's three key things I just want us to look at this morning. Um, the first one is this. When we go through storms, it's important that we understand and remember that Jesus is present with you in the storm. All right, there's going to be three simple little points this morning. Just to end the story, that Jesus is present with you in the storm. Now let's go back and just break it down. Let's look at verse 37. It says this. Going back to verse 37, it says, A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. I mean, this thing's ready to sink. It's taken on water. These guys are freaking out. And Jesus was where? He's in the stern. 
He's in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Now, now notice my point wasn't that when the storms hit in life, Jesus is sleeping. <laughs> that would not be good preaching, would it? <laughs> but, but what we see here is that this, like the, this, I think, is the only time in the entire New Testament where it says that Jesus was sleeping. All right? But what's interesting here is that he's, he's exhausted. He's been teaching all day long. He's exhausted from doing ministry. And he just falls asleep on this cushion in the stern. And he's asleep when all this is happening. Now, how many of you can sleep through storms? Okay, how many of you cannot sleep through storms? How many of you are up looking out the windows? Am I the only crazy one? How many of you have a weather radio? You just kind of monitor. Am I the only? Okay, there's a couple of you. All right. I just want to make sure I wasn't the only geek. But, but Jesus is sleeping during this whole thing. And, and I think sometimes what happens is that there's this common Christian thought, as I've just, you know, through the years I've been in ministry, where I hear Christians say, well, if Jesus is with me, then why am I going through a storm? You ever think that? If Jesus is with me, then why am I going through a storm? And, it's, and there's this thought that I shouldn't be in a storm if Jesus is with me. That's a good question to ask. But what's important for us to understand is that in God's word, God doesn't promise us that a storm isn't going to hit. He doesn't promise us that we're not going to experience storms. He doesn't even promise us that in the midst of when the storm hits that the boat's not going to rock. But what he does promise us is that we're not going to sink and that he's going to get us through the storm. The boat and our lives are not going to sink. Jesus is with you. He's with us in the storm. And so just a little simple bullet point here is we should never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. When the challenges of this life hits, and sometimes it can get really windy, it can get really rocky, it can get very turbulent, it can get very difficult. And I'm not talking about just physical storms. I'm talking about challenges that we go through in this life. We should never doubt the presence of God. And we're going to get into the significance of this here in just a moment because Jesus is here with us. And what happens, as we saw in the story with Peter, when Jesus comes walking out on the water in a different story, is, is that as soon as we take our eyes off of Jesus and get our eyes on the storm, that's when we begin to go under. But what's important to understand here is that he is with us, he is present with us in the storm. The second thing, number two, is just simply this. Not only is Jesus with us in the storm, but Jesus' promises are with you in the storm. Because sometimes it's easy, as we're in this series called Captive, it's easy to be just captivated by, just taken captive by fear. I mean, we're just freaking out, not really sure what's going to go on. How are we going to get through this mess? How are we going to get through this challenge that just hit our family, hit our lives? How are we going to get through this? And we need to understand Jesus' promises are with us when we're going through the storm. Let's go back to verse 35, looking at this story. It says this. It says, he, referring to Jesus, said to his disciples, what did he say? Let's go over to the other side. Now, if Jesus is telling them that we're going over to the other side, then where are you going? To the other side. All right? But what happens is, is in the moments when challenges hit and we're in this boat and it begins rocking in the wind and all the storms begin to hit in life, it's easy to begin to question whether or not Jesus is with us and whether or not he's going to hold up his end of the deal. But Jesus said, hey, we are going to the other side. And that's the importance of why we need to be in the word of God and have it in our lives. I know you hear me say this all the time. It's just the significance of just having God's word to be an anchor for us when we go through the storm. Now, here's why the disciples should not have been afraid. Had they really understood who Jesus was, had they really understood the power of the word of God, when you go back into the Old Testament in Psalm 107, There's some significant things in Psalm 107. In Psalm 107, the psalmist is writing about all these scenarios that take place in life and some of the challenges and the storms that we go through in life. And right in the middle of Psalm 107 is about a a storm, about these sailors that are out on the water. And this is how Psalm 107 goes. It says, some went out on the sea in ships. This is one of the scenarios that he's writing in here. Some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. So they're just experiencing just the awe of God and his creation. 
It says, for he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. So they're experiencing this, this storm that's hitting. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. You can just see the picture of this big waves going on. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wits' end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He what? He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let him exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. So here in this, in the, the psalmist is just giving us a scenario of when the storms of life hit, of just the significance of just of God's words. We look back, the disciples should have understood that, that God is the one who calms the storms. God is the one who is there with them when they're going through the storm to rescue them, and he's going to get them to their desired haven. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. And when he said we're going to the other side, he meant we are going to the other side. So Jesus is present with us when we go through the storm. And we need to, have to hold on to his promises in our life when we're going through the storm. It's our anchor to help us. When we see God's word, it gives us courage to know that regardless of what comes our way, God is with us and for us to get us through the storm. And then the third thing, just as simply, is this. And this is the important part of this whole thing, is that Jesus is perfecting you in the storm. Jesus is perfecting you in the storm. Now, doesn't that sound exciting? Now, here's what's important to understand about this story. These guys didn't experience the storm because they were outside of the will of God. They experienced the storm because they were right in the will of God. You see, Jesus knew that this storm was going to hit. And he still said, hey, let's get in the boat and let's go to the other side of the lake. He knew this whole thing was going to unfold. Now, some of you may be asking this question. It's a good question. So you're saying that God causes the storms in my life? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. I don't think there's any person that really can say whether or not something is 100% from God or not. But what Scripture does tell us is that he will be with us and that God uses the storms. He uses the challenges, the difficulties, the things that we go through in this life to perfect us, to mold us into the image of Christ. And it's really what's going on real, right here in this whole story. This is what um, James writes in James 1, 2 through 4. And I've shared this verse with you before. It's just a, a key um, passage of scripture where it says this. It says, consider a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, doesn't that just sound like an exciting verse to memorize? <laughs> Be joyful, you know, when you go through just the difficulties in this life, when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, here's the deal. Now, all of us, we've got our kids in here today. Kids, how many of you had to take a test in school? All right. You've always had, now, why do we take a test? Because we're learning something and the teacher wants to see whether we've completed that level so that we can go on to the next level. And we see throughout Scripture that God allows certain tests to come our way to prepare us, to work in us, to learn so we can learn to trust him, to better understand who he is, that he is with us, he is faithful. We're singing in the songs, that even though we're in the boat and we're going through these storms in life, that Jesus is with us. Now, sometimes I'll agree, sometimes we wonder whether he's asleep or not, right? I mean, we read that in the Psalms, we're crying out, it's like, God, where are you? But his word, his promise to us is that he is always with us. His promise is he will never forsake us. He will never fail us. Matter of fact, there's a couple people we can see in Scripture that went through storms. Jonah. Now, Jonah went through a storm. Now, was Jonah in the will of God or was he outside the will of God? He was outside the will of God. Why? Because God told Jonah to go to these wicked people in the city of Nineveh, all right, 
They were, they were bad people, and Jonah probably experienced some of his family members suffering under the wickedness of the people of Nineveh. And Jonah's like, there is no way I'm going to go tell those people to trust, to repent, and turn from their doing wrong, and trust God. And God will rescue them if they, if they repent and turn from their wickedness. He said, there's no way. So what does Jonah do? He goes and gets on a boat, and he sails the opposite direction, trying to get away from doing what God called him to do. So what does God do? Stirs up a storm out in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the sea. And then these guys are throwing everything overboard, trying to, trying to salvage the boat. And what does Jonah do? He says, hey, guys, here's the reason why. It's because of me. I'm disobeying God. You're going to have to throw me in the water. And they're trying frantically to do everything but doing what Jonah said. And the moment they threw Jonah in the water, the sea calmed, Right? And then God sent that big fish to swallow him up and then take him and spit him out on shore right outside of Nineveh. When you read through Acts 27, we read about the Apostle Paul. Now here is just a good example of how God uses storms in our life. The Apostle Paul, he is out proclaiming the good news of Christ. He's planted a bunch of churches, started a bunch of churches in the Mesopotamian area in Asia Minor. Just going around starting new churches, strengthening the churches. While he's doing that, he is falsely accused and arrested and put in prison. It happened multiple times, but he's put in prison. And then he appeals to Caesar, and so they're going to take him to Rome. Well, the way they were going to get him to Rome was they were transporting him part of the way by sea. And so he gets on this boat, this ship. It's in Acts 27. And as they're going, a storm hits. It was late in the season. And they're like, hey, this probably isn't a good idea. It's like, no, we're going to go. And they just kept pushing and pushing. And they ran into bad weather. And they said, no, we're just going to go to this other place. And this whole storm hits. And they're throwing everything overboard, just trying to salvage everything. And then one of the soldiers says, let's kill the prisoners. <laughs> and, you know, and Paul says, there's no need for that. God spoke to me last night. He sent his angel. And he said, he's going to rescue us. The ship is going to be destroyed but our lives are going to be saved. Now, Paul goes through this crazy storm, and yet God was with him through some of the most horrendous experiences of his life and got him through. And God used it to reveal his power to those people that were around him and with him to where, where Paul ends up proclaiming the gospel to the head of state at Rome because of all this. So here's the deal. Fear can hold us captive in so many ways, and it's easy at times to put our faith in ourselves and in a boat, in our skill, rather than putting our faith in God and letting God do the work in us. Let's pick up in verse 38 here in this story. So it says here, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him up saying, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, if you were with us last week, sounds very familiar, familiar doesn't it, to what Martha said, Jesus, don't you even care <laughs> that my sister Mary is just sitting there doing nothing while I'm trying to do all this work? And the disciples are like, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? We're taking on water. Of course Jesus cares. But as I said earlier, the moment we get our eyes off of Jesus and we start focusing on the storms and the circumstances in this life, fear begins to take us captive. And that's when we begin to sink and here this whole time, Jesus is asleep. And I really think that Jesus is there just waiting for them to come to a posture, as we saw with Mary last week, of surrender. So let's pick up verse 39. So this is what Jesus does. So Jesus, he got up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. The wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, wouldn't you agree it's a whole lot easier to believe in God when you're standing on dry ground <laughs> than when you're standing out in a boat in the middle of the ocean when everything is outside of your control? <laughs> it's a lot easier to trust God when you're on dry ground, when you, you feel like you're in control. And here they're completely out of control, and Jesus just completely calms the storm. And now these guys, you know, he says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You see, the key in this whole story is this. The greatest fear for the disciples wasn't whether they were going to drown. It wasn't their physical problem that they would physically drown. The greatest fear that Jesus had was their lack of faith, where they were spiritually. 
And this was a defining moment in their life in this story. Let's look at verse um, 41, the last verse here, verse 41. This is what it says. It says, they were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now here's the key to this story. The Pamela Witch translation, you were the word afraid is used two times. Jesus asked him, he says, why are you afraid? I mean, they, they've seen Jesus do all these miracles, heal people. Set people free that were demonized. They seem to do all these miracles. And now they're in this boat and the storm's hitting and, and they're just completely freaking out. It's like, don't you understand who I am? And he says, why are you so afraid? Now here's the thing. That first word afraid, the, the etymology, which is the breakdown and the background of this word is, it means that it's a cowardly, it's used throughout scripture as a cowardly type of fear. All right? That it's an unbelieving, cowardly type of fear. And in verse 41, it says, when they were terrified, terrified or afraid, this is a totally different word in the Greek. And this is where we get the word phobia from. All right? And this is an awestruck, a sudden struck of fear. And it's a reverent kind of fear that what Jesus was really after in them was to get them their eyes off of the physical and get their eyes on the eternal so they could completely understand who he was, that he was the one who had power over all of creation and that there was no need to be afraid. When we're going through the storms in this life, it's not about the external, but it's about the eternal and that Jesus is with us. And this is what John writes. I want to close with this. In 1 John 4, 18, the apostle John was in the boat with these guys. And this is what he tells us about fear in 1 John 4, 18. He says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now this is what the Apostle John picks up from this. He realized in his experience with Jesus, it was a defining moment being in this boat. <laughs> They were fearful for their lives. They were fearful for all the things that were going on around them. We see this throughout the Gospels. But when this incident takes place, they have a whole different perspective on who Jesus is. Their eyes are open, and now their fear changes from this cowardly type of fear to a reverent awe of who Jesus really is as the Son of God. And John writes in this letter to the church, and he says, look, here's the deal. There's no fear in love. You need to understand that God is love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. What Jesus was trying to accomplish in the boat on that day was to drive out the wrong kind of fear and to create in them an awestruck, a reverent type of fear of worshiping who God was. Was Because he says perfect, perfect love drives out fear because fear is to do with punishment, but the one who fears is not made perfect in love. And so the whole purpose of the storms that we go through in life is not that we're afraid, but that we clearly understand who Jesus is. He's with us in the storm. His presence is there. His promises are with us. So we keep our eyes fixed on him and that he's perfecting us through the storm to make us more like him. Amen.